with that, I'll go ahead and get started with this next panel. I'm very excited that I've been given the opportunity to moderate this panel, and we are joined with an amazing lineup of scholars, including Professor John Witt, Professors Lisa Vertinsky, Anna Santos Rushman, Yaniv Haled, and Professor Bridget Crawford. So with the other panels, what we're going to do is I will introduce each panelist in which they'll have the opportunity to share their work. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for an interactive sessions for those in the audience to ask questions. And I have some questions myself. To begin, we're going to have Professor John Fabian Witt, who is the Alan H. Duffy Class of 1960 Professor of Law at Yale Law School. He's the author of a number of books, including American Contagions, Epidemics, and the Law from Smallpox to COVID-19, and Lincoln's Code, The Laws of War in American History, which was awarded the Bancroft Prize, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and was selected for the American Bar Association's Silver Gavel Award. So without further ado, Professor Witt, we invite you to share your work. Wow, thank you, Claire. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dan, for inviting me and uh, Megan for running logistics and, and everybody else for making this um, making this happen. One of the um, one of the great advantages, as Judge Palmeyer was just describing, is I, I can participate remotely. Um, so uh, so it's nice to be able to, uh, to to join you. And I was eager to uh, to join this amazing conference that I've learned so much already uh, today, but I was eager to join because I, I um, wanted to say a few words about a book I just wrote, but take the advantage, take advantage of this conference to, to extend an idea that I was starting to develop in it, but it didn't really get a chance to work out in the book itself. And so I um, thought I might uh, work, try to work that out with you uh, today in the next couple of minutes. Let me try to share my screen. Um, uh, these are the moments when I become technologically incapable, but I think maybe I've done it uh, let's see. Um, all right, but you're gonna, all right, good. So I think you, I think you're looking at it now. Um, so here's here's the, what I want to talk about today is um, uh, I, I like obscure titles that no one can no one can make sense of. So if you have ideas for titles at the end, please share them. So uh, the scrambling the new sanitationism. What do I mean by this? I want to talk about um, civil liberties and public health uh, in our time uh, in the age of COVID, and I, I want to try to persuade you. Um, that the history of civil liberties and public health has been um, a discontinuous. We've had some radically different models just in the last century. It's a more interesting and full of disjunctures uh, story than, than, you might, than you might imagine. Uh, I'm drawing on this book, which really just came out um, a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, but pushing some of the arguments in it a little bit, a little bit further, and I'll be glad to, to, um, to, to be able to uh, talk about that with you and, and I guess publish it uh, with, with you as, as well. And that, that's where we're headed. Um, uh, first, uh, a, an exhortation to think about history here. So this is a quip that's being passed around in infectious disease specialist circles these days. It's the 19th century was followed by the 20th century, which was followed by the 19th century again. Uh, that is to say, we're, we're back in a world, not a, not a new, not a radically new world, but uh, an all too familiar world in which human communities are uh, racked with infectious disease. There's reason to think that this may be more of a problem in the 21st century than it's been in the last mm, half century, three quarters of a century. Uh, we can talk about that uh, afterwards, but, but so history might be a source of lots of lessons and um, uh, uh, for us as we move into the, into the future. In, in the book, I describe two kinds of legal regimes, drawing on the long literature. I, I'm, not, I'm not first to come to this literature. I, I may be last for the moment, but certainly not first. And, and the literature has two kinds of legal regimes. You know, one is contagionist theories of disease produce quarantinist policies, and those are associated with authoritarian states. Think, uh, think Russia, Prussia, um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, uh, 19th century, and uh, cordon sanitaires and quarantines. Second model, environmentalist theories of, uh, of disease produce what the literature calls sanitationist policies, and we can associate these with liberal states. Think uh, classically, the UK, uh, think tenement reform or other mechanisms of, of improving the environment in which human beings live so as to um, uh, minimize um, the risk of disease. And the book describes the US as having a mixed regime, a uh, mixed history. Sanitationism domestically uh, for white people and for elites and quarantinist at the borders uh, and for non-whites and for really anybody without political clout. Uh, that's one of the central threads in the in the book. 
Uh, and what I want to do um, today is draw out what I'm calling here the scrambling thesis. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge because I want to describe three different historical moments over the last century. The third one is the one I think we're entering into right now. So first is uh, an, an early 20th century tragic view. The tragic view of the relationship between the individual and the state is that these two things are at odds with one another. Uh, it's a tragedy, and, and the job of the, of the law, maybe the job of the Constitution, is to try to manage that inevitable tragic relationship. Um, in the late 20th century, though, there was what I've called in my, in my book a new sanitationist departure. That is to say, a group of public health authorities, experts, came on the scene who insisted that properly understood civil liberties and public health went hand in hand. They didn't have to exist in a tragic relationship. But Wendy Parmet at Northeastern Law School is the, um, is the person who's coined this tragic view uh, phrase. And I think it's really, really useful. And she's part of a generation of public health um, uh, uh, lawyers who insisted that it wasn't inevitable. Um, but right now we're seeing three 21st century challenges to that second synthesis. So that second mode uh, of the new sanitationism. Those challenges I'll try to run out, run uh, through uh, with you briefly. But one is tragedy revisited. We're back to the um, back to the old the old uh, uh, tragic incompatibility of public health and civil liberties. Two is um, partisan farce. Remember that history repeats itself as tragedy and as farce. Uh, and so um, some of our civil liberties uh, 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 contests have become partisan contests. And then third, uh, the real possibility of a coming merger of social rights and civil liberties in which a set of traditional civil liberties ideas are being challenged uh, uh, to, to, to develop social rights add-ons. That's, that's in brief the thesis I want to um, I want to I want to run through a little little history. Um, so you know, Professor Kent Kantorovich this morning uh, gave us a great introduction to Jacobson against Massachusetts, the 1905 case, which in some sense you know stands for the tragic view of the individual versus the state. The compulsory vaccination has for a long time captured that um, that standard tragic view. A, a sub theme or recessive alternative to note in Jacobson, and I want to come back to this is that Justice Harlan suggests that uh, a different way of thinking about it, about the Jacobson case, Har Harlan suggests that real liberty might be achieved through regulation uh, in the face of something like an epidemic, that the only way we can be free and flourish as a community is precisely by managing the effects of autonomy, by restricting that autonomy. And, um, uh, and that recessive alternative is visible there in, in the opinion, although for the most part, it's been understood and, and properly, not, not improperly so, as capturing the Parmet tragic, as embodying the, the Parmet tragic view. One important thing about our history in the 19th century, uh, I think going back still further, um, uh, may be visible in certain uh, strands of the Jacobson case, is that courts throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century did their very best to manage the tragedy of the individual versus the state by finding what a you know, previous generation of constitutional scholars called the passive virtues. Maybe Cass Sunstein would call this minimalism now, but it's ways of, of, of uh, overcoming state overreach in narrow minimalist ways. And so these are all cases that found that particular public health actions weren't unconstitutional, but rather just went beyond the power that had been extended to a, a, by a legislature to an executive, for example. Other ways of doing these passive virtues or minimalist moves included damages uh, of judgments, damages um, awards after the fact of an unreasonable quarantine, like, uh, like this case, or uh, equal protection uh, um, uh, judgments. That is to say, uh, cases deciding not that a state couldn't take some action. This is San Francisco quarantine in 1900, um, but rather that it had to uh, uh, engage in that action on an equal basis, not violating the equal protection clause uh, by, for example, targeting a Chinese population in, a, in Chinatown in San Francisco. So a long history of passive virtues and minimalism as ways of managing the, the, the tragic a choice between individual and state, um, uh, another one of those equal protection cases. Um, but in the, in the last quarter of the 20th century, a new way of thinking about civil liberties and, and public health came online. 
Uh, and it came online in large part associated with HIV AIDS and the HIV AIDS epidemic. And HIV AIDS presented uh, a series of public health challenges that meant that conscripting or uh, um, uh, drawing on the willing participation of people who are at risk or sick was absolutely crucial to managing the disease. It was a disease that was transmitted in private uh, and so very hard to manage except through getting the participation of the people who are at risk. And so uh, the idea emerged among public health uh, authorities that civil liberties and public health might go together. Protecting the rights of the people who are at risk might be crucial to managing the spread of a disease. Um, th that late 20th century synthesis gets embodied in a whole, uh, a whole literature uh, in public health. Uh, here, here's a volume on human rights and public health uh, um, co-edited co by Jonathan Mann, one of the early leaders in that move, but a whole host, a whole generation of, um, of, of new sanitarians come, on, uh, come online uh, uh, proposing this idea that eliciting uh, participation is the way forward for the best public health. The Ebola crisis, uh, um, helped to uh, became another example uh, for this. Um, we had a problem there in which people had come back from Africa. We didn't know where they were. And so uh, eliciting their participation in the management of the disease was absolutely crucial. And so there were some interesting quarantine cases that arose there in which the public health officials took the position that um, civil liberties and public health would, would, go, would go together. But right now, as I say, I think we're scrambling these um, uh, this, this, this late 20th century synthesis. And I want to run just quickly through the three ways in which I think we can see that happening. Um, uh, I, I'm mindful that I don't know how clear how you're going to police me for time. You should, you should, I don't know, you just yank me or something, you pull out your, uh, your, um, your cane and yank me off stage. But, but hopefully I can get through these um, three uh, 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 new moments. So what I have in mind, if I can, so there, um, one is it might be that that late 20th century model, the synthesis, was contingent on a particular disease and a particular state of our technological capacity for managing that disease. And so new things like cell phone tracking and temperature tracking uh, might allow us to uh, use new, uh, um, much more uh, severe controls rather than uh, rely on the eliciting of the voluntary participation of at-risk uh, communities. And so we've seen in uh, some East Asian countries um, a, a much more uh, draconian systems of public health management. We've also seen that, this might connect to something I wanna say in a minute or two, but we've also seen private institutions adopting really quite extraordinary mechanisms of tracking and surveilling participants in uh, those private communities. So here at, at Yale, where I teach, and I, I live here on, on the campus, um, uh, we have a variety of ways that we require students to check in. Uh, we require students, we, we, we track the students through their, through their ID swipes. We, we are able to manage the community precisely by surveilling it and monitoring it. Um, and reason to think that a number of private institutions will, will, will be doing that uh, uh, in, in the coming, in coming uh, months and, and maybe even years. So one scrambling is a return to the tragic view. The individual and the community actually are at odds, the individual's freedom and the, um, uh, and the community's well-being. And on that view, we'll have to figure out how to manage that uh, moving, moving ahead. The second way that um, uh, uh, public health and, um, uh, and individual liberties are being scrambled, that relationship is being scrambled, is what I'm calling here partisan farce, not tragedy, but, but, but partisan farce. And we're, so one thing we've seen over the last six months is that the legal challenges uh, around individual rights as against the state have figured as partisan challenges. Think, for example, of cases in Michigan or Wisconsin or the Western District of Pennsylvania in which um, uh, uh, the challenges have had a partisan, a partisan feel to them. Now, I, I don't want for a minute to say that this is the first time that civil liberties is political. Uh, civil liberties are always political. I mean, just to say partisan in the sense that affiliated with a particular, uh, a, a particular political party. Uh, and that, I think, is a radically new uh, configuration for civil liberties and civil liberties claims in moments of... Um, in moments of epidemics, I think it'll be, it already is a distinctive challenge to public regulation if those forms of public regulation get caught up in partisan 
in partisan battles. Uh, and so civil liberties as tactical moves in a partisan battle is really a new, a new feature of, a, uh, of, of our history here, I think. Right? Not, not new that it's political, always political, new that it's, uh, it's got such a partisan uh, uh, um, uh, divide. And of course, that's deeply connected to our partisan polarization as a country more generally. Um, third way, and here I wanna uh, think about social rights for a minute. So there are some really interesting and disturbing ways in which uh, traditional civil liberties, including the rights of private property, have helped to produce new forms of quarantinism. That is say new forms of exclusion that put individual flourishing at, at, um, uh, at, at, at risk. I think of, for example, of private property and healthcare, a moment when, when healthcare becomes acutely crucial uh, to uh, to private flourishing, private property and healthcare means that uh, civil liberties, the civil liberty and private property, becomes a form of exclusion of uh, individuals from healthcare that they need. Um, uh, one example of this would be intellectual property in pharmaceuticals. Think of the pharmaceutical pricing controversies that have arisen in uh, uh, in in recent years. We haven't quite seen this problem with vaccine access yet because vaccines aren't yet online, um, uh, but uh, in talk about triaging, uh, one real possibility is it can be done through private property mechanisms in the marketplace, uh, and that would produce a real uh, a set of essentially exclusionary exclusionary rules. A second example of this is really the, 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 the simple fact of pervasive private health insurance, uh, which means that a, a number of people get locked out of the um, of, of the health insurance market altogether. So uh, uh, just to, to, to close, uh, look into the future, something that historians should never do. <laughs> and I have no, I have no basis here, uh, no more basis than anyone else, except what are we gonna know? Uh, how, how are we gonna know the future except through, except through the past? Um, uh, I, I'd say, I think we really are at a new historical juncture for thinking about civil liberties and public health. And important here to, to see that we've had a number of different junctures over the last century, century and a half. Um, now we have different modes, and I think we might be moving into a, um, into to a new one. But my own hope would be that we could see the emergence of effective public institutions, um, uh, because the alternative, I think, is increasingly pervasive private coercions, private exclusions, uh, private surveillance and monitoring. And those private coercions are, of course, only ostensibly private. They're all state-backed because private property is, um, is backed by the state. So the hopeful version of this is that we get beyond the new sanitationism. We recapture something like Justice Harlan's real liberty through, uh, through a, a democratic regulation, with the alternative being a kind of dystopian set of, of private coercions. Um, so that's what I wanted to, uh, to, to share with you. I hope, um, uh, hope to, to hear from your questions and make this a better paper uh, than, um, certainly a better paper than, than it is already. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to, to working on it. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Witt. And we look forward to questions after all three have presented. Our next paper is the need for tort law privilege of self-defense and necessity in intellectual property law. And for this, we have three panelists. The first is Professor Liza Vertinsky, who's an associate professor of law at Emory Law, where she focuses on the regulation of healthcare markets and technologies, global health, intellectual property, and law and economics. Prior to joining the Emory faculty, she practiced focusing on intellectual property transactions. Second is Ana Santos Rushman, who's a professor of law at St. Louis University, where she teaches a range of courses relating to health, intellectual property, and food and drug law. Professor Santos Rushman has received numerous awards and recognition for her work in those areas, including being named a visiting fellow by the Center for Intellectual Property and Policy and Management Fellowship at the University of Bournemouth in the United Kingdom. And finally, for this uh, paper, we have Professor Yana Paled, who's an associate professor of law at Georgia State University College of Law, where his research focuses on legal and ethical aspects of biomedical technologies. Prior to joining Georgia State Law, he practiced intellectual property law with Goodwin Proctor LLP in New York. All right, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Yadip Haled. Uh, I'm a, as uh, um, Claire said, I'm associate professor at Georgia State College of Law. Um, and first, uh, myself and my co-authors, Anna Santos Rochman and Lisa Bertinsky, um, would like to thank the organizers for putting up this symposium and for everyone and to everyone for participating. 
Um, the paper that I'm going to talk about today, which actually um, we changed the title, slightly changed the focus. It's about um, why um, the need for the tort law necessity defense in intellectual property law um, is about bringing the tort law necessity defense to intellectual property. The paper grew mostly out of some of the issues that my co-authors and I have been seeing during the COVID-19 pandemic in the context of intellectual property, mostly uh, concerning access to treatments and public health. But since all three of us work mostly in the area of biomedical innovation and public health, we've been toying with some of these ideas for quite a while. And so we would be very interested to hear people's thoughts about the role that necessity might play in intellectual property law. I'll start by describing three scenarios that we considered in the paper. One was that was reported in the media and two others that we think might actually happen if they haven't happened already, but which unlike the first scenario are very unlikely to be publicized. In the first scenario, a local hospital runs out of ventilator valves, which are crucial components that the hospital needs in order to keep its ventilators running. The hospital tries to buy more valves, but because every other hospital needs the same valves at the exact same time, the valves manufacturer cannot meet the demand and the valves are unavailable for purchasing for any price. The doctors working at the hospital who are afraid that they're about to run out of valves um, and would not be able to keep their patients alive, ask local engineers to see if they can make 3D printed copies of the ventilator valves, and if so, deliver the 3D prints to the hospital pronto. Um, no, I'm saying pronto, not ASAP, because this story comes from Northern Italy. So the engineers go ahead and pretty easily do just that. They scan the respirator valve in a 3D scanner, create a CDU file of the valve, and then use the CDU file to 3D print 100 replacement valves. They then hand over the 100 3D printed valves to the hospital. The hospital then uses the valves to keep the respirators running and patients breathing. The second scenario involves lab chemists or compounding pharmacists. For those who are perhaps less familiar with what compounding pharmacists are, these are small or very small manufacturers of pharmaceuticals who typically make special orders of pharmaceuticals that are otherwise difficult to obtain on the market or that require some special modification that is necessary for a specific patient or group of patients. So these lab chemists or compounding pharmacists make a pharmaceutical drug for treating COVID-19 that is, again, in short supply. A possible example is the COVID-19 drug Remdesivir that was approved by the FDA earlier this year and that Gilead Pharmaceuticals, the drug's owner and manufacturer, has been unable to manufacture in sufficient quantities even just to meet the demand in the United States. So the chemists or compounding pharmacists make batches of the drug and then hand them over to patients or doctors or hospitals that are, able, that are unable otherwise to buy the drug. The third example involves an employee of a pharmaceutical company. The employee is aware that the company is holding as a secret or is withholding some key information that could help others in developing or making treatments for COVID-19. The information could be clinical data that wasn't published and which is crucial for the development of COVID-19 treatments or for assessing the safety and efficacy of an existing drug. Or the information could be manufacturing know-how for how to make complex pharmaceuticals for the treatment of COVID-19. So the employee hands the information over to some third party. The third party could be another group that is working on developing treatments for COVID, or it could be the FDA or even the media or the employee might just post the information on the internet. And she does so in hopes that the information could be used to make others, other treatments for COVID-19 or for better evaluating existing treatments. In all these examples, the motivation of the actors is to help save the lives of COVID-19 patients and fight the pandemic, which is recognized by the Department of Health and Human Services and by the World Health Organization as a public health emergency. And in all of these examples, these individuals are, almost without doubt, committing infringement of IP rights. In the first scenario of the engineers who are 3D printing the respirator valves, the engineers might be liable for direct or indirect infringement of patents on the valves or the respirators, or methods of making and using the valves or respirators in which these valves are installed. 
Also, in creating and using a digital file that contains the instructions for printing the valve, it is very possible that the engineers are infringing copyright law. In the second scenario of the lab chemists or compounding pharmacists, the chemists and, and pharmacists are probably liable for making and selling or offering for sale patented pharmaceuticals. And in the third scenario of the employee who is sharing the information without authorization, the employee is going to be liable for misappropriation of trade secrets. As a result, the actors of, in these three scenarios are going to be deterred from, from taking actions that we believe are in the public's interest. And indeed, we know that the engineers in the 3D printing example decided not to share the CDU file with the instructions for printing the respirator valves because they were afraid of IP liability. So we believe that these actions by these actors should be sanctioned under the law and even encouraged. But current intellectual property laws in the United States do not make allowances for such actions under these, such, under these circumstances. But IP laws, as they currently stand, do not have any, so they don't have any defenses or exemptions that could offset the risk of fear of liability in situations that, like the ones we describe in the article, which is where we think the tort law, uh, common law necessity doctrine comes in. Um, this doctrine, which is also known as the lesser evil doctrine, um, has the, the, the following requirements, just as a refresher. So if a person acts to protect their own or other people's interests, including by saving themselves or others from bodily harm, and the actions are to avoid or mitigate imminent harm, and as a result of their actions, they cause damage to a third party by trespassing into the third party's property or damaging the third party's property, and the damage that they cause is not excessive, namely, it is proportional or reasonable as compared with the harm that they were trying to prevent, then the tortfeasor's actions are going to be privileged. That is, the tortfeasor's actions cannot be enjoined and are allowed to take place under the law. However, and this is a big however, the law distinguishes between two kinds of necessity that come with very significant differences in their consequences for the tortfeasor. The first is known as public necessity. That is, when the tortfeasor acts in order to mitigate or prevent imminent harm to the public in general, and when the tortfeasor is said to act out of public necessity, the tortfeasor can raise the public necessity argument as a complete defense against, the li against liability, and she will not be liable for whatever damages that she has caused, so long as these damages are, again, reasonable under the circumstances. The second type of necessity is private necessity, which is when the tortfeasor acts to mitigate or prevent imminent harm to themselves or some other specific person or entity. When that is the case, the law in the United States has been clear that the tortfeasor's actions are privileged, but the privilege is not complete. So the tortfeasor is liable to compensate the property owner for the damages that the tortfeasor has caused. So if we apply this double-headed doctrine to the, to the situations that we described, we can pretty much say that in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, the engineers, the chemists, the compounding pharmacists, and the employees of the company that own the information that is being kept secret are all acting out of what they view and can be reasonably viewed as an imminent danger to the public and or some specific individuals or entities. We can also argue that the actions taken by the tortfeasors in these situations could meet the reasonableness requirement in the sense that although they do cause some damage to the IP owner, they are meant to avert bigger harms to people who are suffering from COVID-19 and might die as a result or to the public health during the time of the pandemic that is a global health emergency. Which brings us to some of the problems that come up when we try to apply the necessity doctrine in the context of, of IP. First, current IP laws do not have a necessity defense. But we think that this shouldn't be a big problem. Even though IP law has been increasingly statute-based, it's not viewed by courts as a strictly code-based body of law, and many aspects of IP law borrow from and rely heavily on common law doctrines from outside of IP law. Also, judges deciding IP cases typically allow litigants to make arguments that are based in other areas of law, and courts have frequently imported into IP law doctrines from other areas of the law, with many of these doctrines later becoming incorporated into IP statutes. 
Also, the current way we perceive IP rights as a form of property and of IP lawsuits as based in tort law actually indicates that the common law necessity doctrine would be a good fit for IP laws. But then there are bigger problems that we need to address when we try to apply the necessity doctrine to IP. The second problem is in deciding whether, a diff whether different actions by different tort feasors would be subject to the public necessity defense or the private necessity defense, which determines whether the tort feasor would need to compensate the IP owner. Here, the law in the United States, although it has been the topic of some significant disagreement over the last century or so, is clear. If the tort feasor acts to benefit the public and not themselves or some specific individual or specific entity, then they would not be liable to pay the IP owner for whatever damages they cause. But if they take their actions to benefit a specific patient or a group of identifiable patients or entities, like a hospital, then they would need to compensate the IP owner for the damages that they have caused. This might create a significant, significant deterrence where the tort feasors are taking actions that we think are desirable. And as a result, in what may seem as a pretty random uh, line drawing, so, for instance, if the engineers in Northern Italy did what they did to benefit the public in general, uploaded their CDU file to the Internet and told hospitals around them that they are putting a box with vaults outside of their office door, then they would arguably be acting out of public necessity and would not be liable for whatever damages that they have caused the IP on. If, however, they make the vault specifically for the hospital, then they might be required to pay back the IP owner about $10,000 per vault which is the market price for the valves. Now, we think that this problem is solvable by construing what, we, what would be considered as public necessity broadly. Another possible solution is through a me the measure of damages that should be awarded. For example, if valves are not available on the market, then under US patent law, the IP owner cannot be compensated for the price of the valve and would only be entitled to reasonable royalties, which under the circumstances might be very low, if, no, if not nominal. The third problem comes up in situations where the tort feasor actually charges or tries to make profit. Compounding, pharma uh, comp compounding certain pharmaceuticals, for instance, can be very expensive. Should the lab chemists or compounding pharmacists be able to charge for the pharmaceuticals they make and still claim the necessity defense? And if the answer to this last question is yes, how much should they be able to charge before they are no longer, no, no longer able to argue that they have acted out of necessity rather than from motivation to make money? And fourth, and perhaps the most significant problem comes up when we try to think about possible implications of bringing the necessity doctrine to, to IP situations that are outside of the context of the COVID-19 pandemic perhaps the next pandemic, or perhaps some other public health crisis. What are exactly the conditions that must be met before we allow a tortfeasor to claim necessity when they try to address an imminent danger to life or limb? One possible solution would be to require that there first be some formal declaration of health emergency by a health-oriented agency like the World Health Organization or the Centers for Disease Control. But if this is the standard, then it could potentially create an issue for maintaining sufficient incentives for innovation. Take, for instance, the HIV AIDS epidemic and think about the proprietary drug that is known as the pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP for short. We know that HIV AIDS has been treated as an epidemic by the Centers for Disease Control. We also know that many people cannot afford PrEP, which was at some point known as the $1,000 a day pill. Suppose a compounding pharmacist starts making PrEP in her pharmacy and then advertises online that she is willing to send it to doctors who need to treat patients that could not otherwise afford PrEP. Would this qualify as a situation where the necessity defense could be raised? And will courts view such actions as reasonable under the circumstances, given the need to maintain incentives for innovation? These are all very difficult issues that would need to be resolved if we are to apply the necessity defense to IP laws. But we don't think these problems are unsolvable and we believe that courts deciding IP cases in which the necessity defense may be argued can do so as they do with other difficult legal issues. We think that none of the challenges we identify should deem the necessity doctrine inapplicable to IP cases and drive courts to disallow necessity arguments in IP cases in the first place especially in situations of widespread 
healthcare crisis. The challenges that we identify only mean that applying the necessity doctrine to IP cases should be done carefully and thoughtfully so as not to disturb the balance between incentives for innovation and access to life-saving treatments. And with that, I'm going to stop and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Haled. Our final panelist for this panel is Professor Bridget Crawford, who will be presenting the paper that she's working on with Professor Kelly Purser and Professor Tina Cockburn. Professor Crawford is a professor of law at Pace University, where she teaches federal income taxation, estate and gift taxation, and wills, trusts, and estates. Her scholarship focuses on issues of taxation, especially wealth transfer taxation, property law, wills and trusts, and tax policy. Prior to joining the Pace faculty, Professor Crawford practiced law at Milbank, Tweed, Hadley, and McCloy LLP in New York. All right, thank you so much. Big thank you to all of the organizers of this program. Um, it is very early in uh, Australia, uh, so my colleague Tina Cockburn is able to join, but not quite um, be ready uh, to present in the wee hours of her Saturday morning in Australia. Kelly Purser also couldn't be here because of the time difference. Our research is into the question of what happened with wills during the pandemic? And at risk of causing everyone bad flashbacks, either to your trust and estates class, or if you're already admitted to the bar, a little shiver down your spine uh, for this black letter nugget here, wills traditionally, traditionally require two witnesses, two witnesses. And those generally speaking, over time have been interpreted in, in different ways. The most conservative approach is always to have the two witnesses together with the testator. And just to really hammer it home, the Uniform Probate Code, here it is, tells us that a will has to be in writing, signed by the testator, and either signed by two individuals or by a notary. Not every state uh, allows uh, notaries to sign wills, but the, the writing, the signature, and the witnesses are common components for wills throughout the, the common law uh, jurisdictions. Now, why do we have these formalities? The traditional explanations are fourfold. Uh, we want the testator to take this seriously. In, uh, there's some sort of cautionary or ritual function to executing a will as opposed to just uh, composing a nasty gram on your email and sending it hastily. I know you've all done that or saved one to your drafts folder just like me. So the cautionary function, the evidentiary function, we like there to be hard traditional evidence of the testator's wishes for the disposition of property at death. We say that these wills formalities have a protective function. The notion is that with the presence of witnesses may ward off evildoers from influencing inappropriately, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then the channeling function, uh, courts like wills to look like wills, talk like wills, squawk like wills, so that we know it when we see it, we have these formalities. The problem, of course, during a pandemic, it's very difficult to gather uh, people together, especially folks who, for whatever reason, are particularly vulnerable to the coronavirus. So in the United States and in Australia and some other jurisdictions, um, even before the pandemic, good to know that some jurisdictions have adopted electronic will legislation. And I thought I just couldn't bring it, uh, uh, bring myself to put out a map showing which states, you know, I feel like we've all been probably looking at a lot of maps coded in color in the last week or so. So I, I went with the seals of the great states of Utah, Illinois, Florida, and Arizona, are the only four ju jurisdictions in the US at least that allow for electronic wills. But that electronic will legislation 
does not necessarily get rid of the witness requirement. All it gets rid of the requirement is there needing to be a paper copy with the so-called wet ink signature, right? So it's not especially controversial that someone could sign something digitally and Utah in particular is quite clear that you can have witnesses signed digitally too, but they have to be with you. Mm, that's a problem during a time of COVID. Queensland in Australia, which my co-authors uh, will be extremely familiar with, they have a, a dispensing power which uh, will allow certain electronic documents to be validated, separate and apart from, from pandemic time. But not every jurisdiction has these electronic wills, legislation, or dispensing powers. So how did states respond to an urgent need for witnesses uh, on documents during uh, the pandemic? Well, uh, almost every jurisdiction in the United States, many states in Australia and in other countries adopted rules allowing for the remote witnessing of wills. So it was possible, it is still possible in those jurisdictions for a, a, a would-be testator to come on to Zoom or FaceTime or uh, Skype and say, I'd like you to watch me witness my will and there's some procedural rules that have to be followed. But these remote witnessing rules were widely promulgated, widely uh, promulgated. And what my co-authors, Tina Cockburn and Kelly Purser and I are very interested in is a seeming tendency among academics, some academics to say, yes, this is the solution that we've been waiting for to get rid of those musty, dusty, fusty will execution requirements in writing signed by the testator or the witnesses. This is what we need. This is the solution to bring will making access to testation to more people. And my co-authors and I, our response is, or what we argue uh, in the essay to be, uh, is we should not rush to adopt remote witnessing rule. Now, I myself have been highly critical of these formalities. I don't think having in-person witnesses necessarily do a great job of, of performing the protective function because there are a whole lot of uh, cases brought uh, with disinterested witnesses who were there, thought the testator was not unduly influenced, and the court has in fact found that. So I'm not in love with in-person witnesses as the cure for all problems, but we have three questions, three questions for further research. First and foremost, who availed themselves of the pandemic era ongoing remote witnessing uh, rules? Were those folks who were already going to execute a will and just, oh, bummer, I can't go to my lawyer's office to execute it? Or did, in fact, te technology open up the ability to make a will to a wider range of folks? The Connecticut statute, for example, says one of the remote witnesses have to be a lawyer. I don't think a statute like that is going to increase will making. Second, how well does remote witnessing work? I don't mean, can you see what someone signs, uh, but how well could the remote witnesses ascertain whether the testator was being influenced by a family member or someone standing off screen urging them to sign a particular document? How do we know what led up to the will execution? And how does that uh, remote vehicle, Zoom, FaceTime, uh, Skype, how does that make the witnesses assessment of mental capacity uh, for a vulnerable testator more difficult? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we just don't know. We need, uh, we need to, to answer that question. And then secondly, or thirdly, I should say, our final question is, once we have some pandemic era wills going to probate, 
are these wills uh, drawn pursuant to the relaxed witnessing requirements more likely to be subject to the standard challenges based on lack of mental capacity, fraud, et cetera, et cetera. So did the easing of the traditional requirements cut down on litigation or uh, increase it, or did it stay the same? So our main recommendation is that we need to take a more cautious approach before changing uh, the traditional approach to will execution. And I think I've gotten us in well under time. And so I can turn it back to the moderator for some questions. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'll open it now up for questions. Make sure to raise your blue hand or put it in the chat. And while we wait for those blue hands to raise, I have a question to start off from some legal form staff members. For Professors Vertinsky, Haled, and Santos Rushman, someone asked, a huge part of the COVID-19 health crisis is the impact the virus has had on underlying medical conditions. So can this tort law defense and interaction with necessity be applied if an inventor creates a new miracle drug that doesn't necessarily address COVID, but addresses an underlying health concern? Would there be limits to the application? That's, that's a great question. Um, so I don't see why not. I mean, I don't see any categorical reason for why that would not be the case. And I think that, again, this would be one of those instances where, you know, line drawing would need to, to be done by a court or by an attorney giving legal, giving legal advice to you know some compounding pharmacist or or someone who might try to make the drug available to to people. Again, we we are balancing. You know, the balance here is going to be saving people's lives um, in a situation where there is um, insufficient drug or or for some other reason there is no access to the drug. Um, so. Again, going back to you know what I think uh, we described as our third challenge, it would all depend on whether doing so would be considered by a court as the lesser evil. Um, it goes to the issue of proportionality or reasonableness, reasonableness of the measure. Um, and you know this is this is a perfect example of how things become a little fuzzy when we stop thinking about COVID-19 and how, you know, COVID-19 has made things very simple in some ways because it is such a momentous emergency. And, and it's, you know, really crystallizing some of the issues. But as, as you know, uh, um, John Witt said, you know, we've been dealing with the issue of pharmaceutical prices for a very long time now. And the argument that pharmaceuticals should be made available to people, even if they can't afford them, is not a new one and has been made from you know various various angles and using various um, arguments starting international human rights and ending with the you know most minuscule sections of NIH funding statutes. So I think that necessity um, gives another way of looking at things um, in, in this regard. I personally think that necessity is some, you know, we think that necessity is an elegant solution because it, it doesn't require any legislative action. It doesn't require Congress to decide to, to put it in any of the statutes. It doesn't require the FDA to decide that, you know, some situations would necessitate releasing the drug or information to the public, et cetera. Um, so, uh, the beauty of necessity is that you're going to have an opportunity to raise those claims possibly in court and the judge would actually be able to help without having to raise those arguments in, in the International Human Rights Council. Great. I hope this answers the question. Next, we have a question from... Hi, I actually have uh, two questions, one for one different person. I guess that's the problem with having so many great speakers. Um, I'll go in chronological order. So firstly, for Professor Witt, 
you mentioned a lot of different forms of contact tracing in your presentation and really the importance of it, which is very fair. But how do you um, play in HIPAA into all of that? Because something like you, when you're on a college campus and they're monitoring your swipes and how many people have been in the cafeteria at a time and who else has been there is a form of contact tracing, but it's something that you've already expected. One, you give up a little bit of liberty when you're on a school property, but secondly, also, these are things that were already being monitored in certain ways. You're just using, using the data differently. So you also mentioned though that this is going to be leaking into the private sphere that private companies are going to be starting to do similar um procedures do you see hipaa becoming something that's uh going to need to be factored into all these analyses because it feels like in itself contact tracing is already something that plays tug of war with hipaa and then my second question is for professor crawford um who i know well and adore um she was meant you were mentioning a lot professor about um wills and remote witnessing do you see this as bringing a new issue to will contests not only that more wills will probably need to be contested because of what you were saying that there might be somebody in the room making the testator you know sign this will but also that now more people will have the opportunity to contest or you know use uh the remote signing as an excuse to contest somebody's will. I'm done. Claire, how do you want to proceed? Do Professor Way, maybe you want to answer yours first, and then Professor Crawford, you can go next. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be real quick because I'm, I'm no uh, HIPAA expert, but uh, but um, you know. Uh, uh, the question is a really good one because it raises exactly this tension uh, between a set of you know, now pretty well established privacy rights on the one hand and some uh, new felt public health imperatives on the other. Um, uh, I guess two thoughts to kind of um, uh, turn that on its head a little bit. Uh, um, one is that I think you can see HIPAA being deployed by institutions right now in ways that are designed to shed responsibilities or allow those institutions to do what they want to do independent of HIPAA. That is to say, uh, sometimes it's useful for institutions to hide information and HIPAA provide sort of uh, a plausible HIPAA arguments or colorable HIPAA arguments provide a, 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 a so I, I'm seeing general, I think general counsel's uh, offices generating uh, um, easy HIPAA answers. Uh, I expect to see that more in the future. And the other thing to, to say is um, there's a great uh, a story, um, I think it was in New York Magazine about uh, Manhattan skyscrapers and how they're gonna reopen in coming weeks and months, if they're gonna reopen. And the, the, the really draconian set of public health uh, um, requirements they were gonna insist on as, as uh, conditions for access. That's the kind of thing that I have, have in mind in which participation in certain kinds of high-end forms of life will be conditioned on participation in private surveillance systems. Um, and I, I, I doubt there'll be a HIPAA problem with that, um, And uh, but, but I'm not a HIPAA expert, but that's the kind of private monitoring I have, have in mind. And in terms of the question about uh, wills, will this lead to more litigation? Yes. Absolutely. Insofar as I think most wills litiga litigation is not about fraud, undue influence, duress. Uh, it's really about who did mom leave more, love more, and why did you get the jeans jacket and you know I got the chip dishes. Most wills litigation uh, is not grounded in doctrine. It's grounded in feeling, and this will open the door to an additional factual inquiry that will allow more witness, uh, more contestants. To get their toe in the door. So, uh, practically speaking, I think you're right. Uh, good question. Next, we have a question from. Hi, everyone. Um, my question is for Professors Haled, Santos, Rusman, and uh, Vertinsky. Thank you all very much for presenting to us, and especially Professor Vertinsky, who was my 1L contracts teacher at Emory. Um, so my question is, I, I would like if you could expand a little bit more on maybe an incentives problem that we could run into here. Um, because as I was listening to the talk, I was thinking about why would companies invest in extensive IP research um, in the context of a pandemic if people who work for them could just divulge their IP and get immunity through public necessity doctrine. Uh, it seems different than, than the tort 
necessity doctrine to me because like my my decision on whether to buy a house is really minorly influenced by whether someone would have to use it for necessity um, and receive some sort of immunity for that. However, in this case, it seems like a business's decision to invest in this sort of IP would really be um, based around whether they would actually be able to realize some gain on it. And it seems that if somebody could leak the IP and just invoke public necessity immunity, uh, the incentives to invest in the first place would be really weak. Lisa or Anna, do you want to take that, or I'm I'm happy taking it. Well, so so I'll 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 start, and you need you finish. Um, and first of all, it's nice to see you, <laughs> um, Dylan. Um, one of the so one of the things that I worry most about, and sort of the the economist on the team, was the dynamic efficiency concerns. Um, it's hard to address them in the scope of this project, um, but the truth is in the contexts where you would be seeing kind of the um, public use necessity, the context in which you wouldn't get compensation as part of the use, um, those are the places where you tend to get underinvestment anyway for a number of reasons and where you see a lot of public, um, public sector investment. Um, and so one of the things that we're still working on is how to sort of think through the dynamic efficiency incentives and how to build that in to the sort of the balancing um, and, and, and the types of compensation that are, um, that are provided. But I guess the response is that the current system, um, the way it is now without the necessity defense uh, pushes too heavily in the other direction, right? So the costs of the current system are um, sort of too heavily in the other direction. And, and it's not clear that the ways in which we envision using this defense would actually shift the incentives all that much um, as long as we get the, de the definition of necessity right and we balance out this sort of issue of when co compensation is triggered. So that's not a, a great answer. It's, that's the hard part of this, but um, it's where we're sort of working things through. And if I could just add briefly to um, two additional points, one on the types of goods that we're contemplating um, here. So if you um, think of Professor Hallett's first example, the valves for um, the, the ventilators, we are thinking of goods that are critical in the context of public health um, emergencies, but more likely than not relatively straightforward from a technical perspective. Um, so the valves could be reverse engineered pretty quickly, right? Uh, we don't anticipate these situations, the defense applying um, to extremely complex forms of technology because you just cannot engage in that type of reverse um, engineering. So the same kind of, it's technically not the same, um, but from a market incentives perspective, you're not disturbing things you know, that much when you consider um, that it's either something you can reverse engineer or you've disclosed it um, through your patent uh, or it's still protected. Right, um, just not um, you know through through the law necessarily, but just from a technical pragmatic um, perspective. And then the second thing, in, in addition um, to to the idea of reverse engineering and you know trade secrecy, which is still left uh, undisturbed, um, we. One of the possible um, manifestations of, of our proposal is to just restrict it to certain situations like COVID, right? So if we make this dependent on a declaration or some form of, some form of a formal recognition, um, then for instance, first question underlying uh, conditions, that might not apply there if that's the vision we come to adopt of, of this defense. So there are ways to bring different sets of concerns um, to the table. There are further ways we didn't really get into it of, of tailoring all of this. We can, um, as a society, agree and do that perhaps even legislatively and say, these are the situations we really worry the most. So we can name the types of um, technologies or instances in which uh, the defense might, might apply against. That's a variation, right? Because probably that would require some legislative um, intervention, but it's, it's possible to do it if we're really concerned about certain types of medical devices or pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, in terms of just disturbing um, the market uh, place too much. Great, our next question is from Ann Tweedy. I have a question for Professor Crawford. I was just wondering, are there um, alternatives to will witnesses that seem promising and get at um, some of the protections that the witnesses are supposed to provide? <laughs> 
just to repeat the question, it, are there alternatives? So in the US, some states have notaries, but I'm gonna uh, just uh, tag my, my uh, co-author, Tina Cockburn, who's on the other side of the world and, and it's still the wee hours there. But uh, Tina, if you wanna jump in with um, some other um, details about Australia, um, that would be great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us uh, present here today. I've just woken up. Um, so uh, in Australia, in Queensland in particular, we have a dispensing power so that informal wills can be proved. Uh, that, those, that litigation is actually very expensive and, um, and time consuming. So it hasn't necessarily um, you know, been a solution to the problem of, of informal wills. So that is one way, I, I guess, that um, it's been resolved in, in Australia. So most certainly a lot of those wills are being proved. We've had wills that have been written on, scratched on the side of a tractor when some a person had um, passed after an accident or wills that had been written on computers um, and left in hard drives. So, those actions are successful, but they're very, very expensive. Um, the other part of, of it, I think, too, is not only um, is it a, you know, a solution, but it often leads to more litigation because of uh, challenges about the construction of the clauses. So these wills that are informal are um, of necessity, really, um, homemade wills. So people are very... Um, unsophisticated in the way that they describe what's going to happen. So that itself leads to some more challenges. So we haven't really seen a, um, a viable solution. Perhaps the solution is actually a more in terms of more appropriate safeguards, which can um, make sure that the traditional uh, will, the, the functions are actually um, protected. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Can't Raise Her Blue Hand. Thank you, Claire. Um, so this question is for Professor Witt, but as it relates to the other panelists, I'd love to hear your perspective on it as well. And I'm wondering, um, sort of jumping off of something you mentioned, Professor Witt, about how marginalization and issues of power and oppression relate to our legal responses of the pandemic. Like for instance, two of the talks mentioned the HIV AIDS pandemic, which was prevalent primarily, at least at the beginning in the uh, LGBTQ community, which was heavily oppressed. Um, and that very much shaped our pandemic response, our legal response there. Um, I think this pandemic is unique because it has affected you know, everyone, but as is becoming increasingly obvious from the data, it's disproportionately affecting black and brown communities more um, than white community. So I'd just love to hear um, from a legal history perspective how, uh, sort of jumping off the point you made about how our approaches differ depending on, you know, the, the level of oppression the, the group who is most experiencing the pandemic is, uh, is facing. Uh, thanks, Megan. It's a, a great question. Um, I, I guess uh, it, it, looking at the history, it has seemed to me that since well, since the um, since the arrival of, of European settlers in uh, in North America, that um, uh, disease and communities policy and legal responses to disease have been um, um, you know terrible for for groups without political clout. That might be the the, the that's that's the I think the the essential underlying uh, consideration is political power. I mean, the, the very first land-based quarantine that I've been able to find in North America is uh, 1662 in now fancy East Hampton on at the end of Long Island, which is a quarantine designed to keep Native Americans out of the town of East Hampton uh, until they can show that they're free of disease. And, 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 uh, and that pattern uh, of, of targeting uh, um, uh, party groups without clout oftentimes uh, groups of people who are black or people of color, it just runs through all, all the way through our history, like, a, a, like an electric electric line uh, uh, through through the history. And, and there are lots of ways in which we're seeing that uh, again, again today, partly through indifference, 
um, uh, especially early on in the pandemic, if you think about the communities who are being affected uh, earliest on. Um, so I, I just think that, that that's a um, uh, that's the quarantinist strand in our history. There have been a lot of triumphs in public health history over the course of the last 200 years, really amazing triumphs. Um, you know, ch cholera isn't a thing we deal with anymore. Smallpox isn't a thing we deal with anymore. I mean, these, these are huge triumphs, um, polio. Uh, but along the way, there have been really ugly pieces. And, and so the challenge of thinking about the history is to, to keep both of those things in view. In the interest of time, we're going to take one more question from Robert Bornholz. I think there's a, an interesting statement of the idea of real liberty through regulation in Federalist 37, which I think was uh, the Madisonian or Madison, but it was the Hamiltonian Madison. And he's replying to the anti federalists who are saying the government you're building is too strong and will oppress liberty. And his response is, that if you don't have a government sufficiently strong to enforce the law and to uh, prevent foreign invasion, then there can't be the survival of liberty. And so the basic idea is that liberty or libertarianism has some necessary conditions of its possibility. And a lot of the arguments being made, the partisan litigation now uh, really is, uh, is rhetorical in the sense that it's not looking at the factual context that uh, would enable an actual liberty to survive. And Robert, was that directed at Professor Witt? Oh yes, that's that's uh, directed at. Uh, I think that's that's a, another statement of this idea of what real liberty is, and that might it might involve a certain amount of regulation or effective government. And so you could imagine like a Hamiltonian pandemic policy that uh, recognizes that in order to have an actual effective liberty, you have to deal with certain real emergencies. And it, and it is very much based on the facts of the context. One of the nice things about this this conference is that it's produced an exchange between Professor Kantorovich and me. I'm sorry, not for this, but but uh, um, uh, not not in this group, but 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 by email. And I I've suggested to him that his paper this morning seems to me like a suicide pact with unknown risks in the future. Or that is, if all you can do are the things that are traditional, well, what, when a new thing happens. Uh, so I, I um so I I agree with the spirit of your of your uh, of your suggestion, Mr. Bornholz. That's what you get if you leave the conference, you don't get the last word. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panelists in panel three. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Megan Delury, our symposium editor to wrap up our day. Thank you, Claire. And so that concludes our uh, events for today. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists virtually. <laughs> um, and to our panelists, your talks were absolutely fascinating. And I know I speak for the entire staff of Legal Forum when I say we are very much looking forward to working with you on your papers over the next year and in uh, reading the final result. I'd also like to thank the law school for the support in planning this year's symposium, particularly Dean Miles, Claire Perrins, Alex Short, and the members of the law school events team. Thank you very much to our editor-in-chief, Claire Lee, and our executive articles editor, Dan Simon, for your hard work, and to our staffers for your hard work and your attention and diligence in preparing questions for today. And thank you very much to our moderators for your fantastic facilitation of today's events. Finally, thank you everyone who attended today and for bearing with us in this virtual venue. To end on a hopeful note, although the pandemic deprived of us of the ability to gather together at the law school, in person, we had over 85 unique participants join us today from all around the world, a number and a few that would not have been able <laughs> to fit into room five of the law school. If you missed any of the panels, there will be a recording on, up online in the near future, so be on the lookout for that. And please check back on Legal Forum's webpage for updates on our latest volumes, including the one for this year's symposium. Thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend.